Hello everyone, welcome back to another episode. I'm Coach Kyle, and today I wanna to talk about Bell Let's Talk Day and mental health awareness. And the reason I wanna talk about this is because I looked back at last year and the video that I posted last year, and I got, I got a good laugh because I looked at that person and just was so proud of how much growth and accomplishment I've taken since that person. But on top of that, also to share with you that a lot has changed in a year with my mental health. And although I had those practices last year, a lot of those are no longer in place and a lot of things have changed for me because I really had to take into account what is actually going to work if I want to protect and care for my mental health. So a lot has changed, so I wanna share that with you. And I also wanna just let you know through this video that it's okay to share your story, but it's okay if you don't either. No one is pressuring you to. Just know that you're not alone and that you always have people. And if you feel like you don't, know that you have me, always. In the comment section, in the DMs, in the text messages, however it may be, I am here for you always. So to add more layers to my story based off of last year's video, if you haven't watched it, I encourage you, because there's a lot of good practices that I had a year ago that were protecting my mental health. And now this year, a lot has changed, but like I said, I wanted to share with you my history. So if I look back at my childhood, I recognized I'm a very analytical person. I'm always wondering what's going on around me. And when I grew up, I grew up with interluding father figures. And so what ended up happening was I was paying attention to you know, how they, this person treated this person and how the feelings of this person affected this person. And I was constantly watching everything intertwine with each other and was wondering, is there a different piece of the puzzle that's missing here? Is there a different way we could rearrange this? And then as I got into school, I had those same, same thoughts. I was trying to figure out where my piece of the puzzle landed, who I was supposed to be and where I was supposed to fit in. I felt like I was being pulled in two different directions and I wasn't sure which one to, or which decision to make, which rope to grab. And it was challenging for me. And through both of those times growing up, I never realized that mental health was a thing. And I don't think it was talked about as much back in the day. Back in the day, I'm, I'm not that old, but looking back on those moments, it wasn't a big topic of conversation. And so I never had the opportunity to understand it. Then I got into high school. And in high school, I got into my first long, long-term relationship. And that, looking back, was really where the moment I realized that my mental health was not okay. I had outlandish emotional outbursts when I was by myself that sometimes led to holes in my bedroom walls. I had rages of, or fits of rage where I would self-inflict pain because I didn't know what to do with anything that was going on inside of my body or my mind. It was all so incredibly overwhelming. And it was an incredible experience in a way because it taught me that everything I thought I wasn't, I hadn't faced enough yet to know I wasn't or I was. So I had to learn a lot about myself, but my mental health really took a toll. I found myself depressed a lot. I found myself just wanting to sleep all the time. And looking back on it, having this conversation with you, I just realized that was one of the first times where I started to condition myself to shut off. And that relationship was when I started to tell myself to start shutting off. Around that same time, I remember speaking with my mother and I remember having such an immense feeling of guilt and shame. And that immense guilt and shame was coming from a story I was telling myself that I ruined my mother's life. Not because I had done anything in that moment, but for being born. My mother had me when she was 15 years old. And when I got to a moment where I was conscious of what she was missing out on, I was probably around 15 at the time. All I could think about was how much life I felt I took away from her and how much I, in a way, in that moment, thought I ruined her life. And of course, she reassured me that I didn't, and we had a good conversation about it, but I just remember feeling such immense guilt and shame, and I never really knew what to do with those emotions. And uh, again, emotional outbursts were just off the chain. It was a crazy time in my life. Fast forward a year or two, and a friend of mine was murdered. And I remember experiencing this personal of a death. This was the first time. And I remember seeing his face on the front of the newspaper. And I, it was seven or eight, nine o'clock at night and I was just sitting in this empty parking lot and I was just bawling. I was just flooding the parking lot. 
I had no idea what to do with my emotions and I felt like nobody else around me did either. And so I fell again into that space of depression and anxiety and I just didn't really know how to act or how to feel. And I felt like I just wanted to jump out of my skin. I just wanted it to stop. Luckily, I had a good friend group support in that time. So I just focused on that. But in the process, I suppressed my emotions and I stopped letting them out. Fast forward again a couple years later and another friend of mine is murdered. Her name is Lacey. The gentleman who passed away originally was Ashton and now this is Lacey. And Lacey was murdered by a man who, from my standpoint, had some serious mental health struggles. And I remember that coming across my space and I froze. And that was the second time or the third time where I started to really start to shut off. And I didn't know what to do. And so I remember laying on the couch, debilitated, frozen, not knowing what to do, not knowing how to feel, just knowing I don't want any of this. I want it all to stop. I deflected people, I ignored people. It got to the point where I was just laying on the couch for so long, immobilized, that my partner at the time had to call my family to come to my home to see me because I wasn't moving and I didn't know what to do. I was helpless. It had already happened and there was nothing I could do. And I remember having a conversation about it, but I still, I felt off about it. I didn't feel like that was something I wanted to talk about or that it was okay to talk about or that my pain was okay. That was part of the problem. I was feeling so much pain and at the same time feeling like I shouldn't be feeling all this pain. And so I fell into more depression. Now each of these stories I tell you, I pulled myself out of them, but it wasn't easy. And I fell back into these rock bottom moments many times. A couple, a couple years later, I was met with my real experience of a mental health challenge when a friend of mine took his own life. His name was Nabil. And he took his own life in the basement of where he lived by himself. And I remember being at the funeral, just flooding the room with my tears. They wouldn't stop. And I didn't know how to speak, what to speak, how to speak. I was silent the whole time. Cause I didn't know how to express what I was feeling. I didn't feel like I had the language for it. And so I just kept it all in instead of attempting. So I was just bottling it all up. And I recognized through all those moments of really drastic emotional pain, it was that leading up to that, I never gave myself permission to feel anything. And so I was suppressing each and every time leading up to that moment where it finally had to come out. And I remember trying to figure out how to handle that experience with Nabil passing and his mental health. And I still didn't understand. It still felt like nobody was having the conversation. And so because of that, of course, I wasn't either. If no one's having it, why would I have it? I don't understand it. And then fast forward again a little bit more. Now we're in my late, my mid twenties, um, late twenties. And I had the great fortune of dating a beautiful human, a beautiful soul who had clinically, has, sorry, clinically diagnosed anxiety. And I remember that was the first time where I was really truly faced with something like that. I never felt like I faced myself with it. So I was probably already, ha I had some level of understanding, but in that moment, it was, it was right up front. And I just remember, I never thought that that was a downfall. And I really wanna get this, this point across, and I hope you've made it this far to listen to this point, is that it's not a downfall. It is not something that is wrong with you. And it does also does not, it, um, make up who you are. You don't have to identify with any of these things, but what I want to share with you, the, the most powerful piece of this puzzle was that I really truly realized that mental health was something I needed to focus on in that relationship. And it wasn't because I was neglecting it, but because I realized that it can take over and it can be really painful. And I realized that I had never experienced it to that extent. And it was one of the most powerful experiences I've ever had the opportunity to be a part of. And what I realized I want to share with you again is I never saw it as her downfall. I always saw it as her superpower. 
She had a superpower I didn't have. She could think things I couldn't think. She could feel things I couldn't feel. She could have moments envelop her, not necessarily take over, but just envelop her in passion or pain or what have you. She was able to really identify or not identify, just feel all of the things in such a more deep way than I could. And in a way, uh, I don't know if I ever expressed this, but I was jealous because I couldn't go to those places. And so I always felt like it was her superpower. And so what I, I wanted to share that story with you because if you have clinically diagnosed anxiety or any sort of mental health challenge, I just wanna let you know that it's not a downfall, that it is your superpower and that you in a way have an edge up. And it's not necessarily a competition, but you have an edge up. And she had an edge up on me. And it was just extremely important for me to learn that lesson and understand from her that I have to focus on my mental health. It's a vital importance. 2020 happened and unfortunately that relationship didn't move forward but I remember all of a sudden suicidal ideation came into my life and in full force. It had shown up before but this was the true form where I was really having thoughts of, you know, what's the point? I remember driving down the street and thinking, what if I just didn't stop? and just drove off that bridge or crashed into the car in front of me, would I die? I remember standing on the deck uh, 10 floors up and wondering if I jumped, would I die? Would anybody notice? How long would it take them to notice? I remember laying in bed and thinking to myself, what is the point of all of this? Then my thoughts went further and said, if you don't wake up in the morning, would anybody notice? Better, better question yet, yeah, Kyle, how long would it take them to notice? And if it wasn't instantaneously, then is there value to your life? Through all of these moments that I've ever had these really challenging thoughts, I never felt like I was gonna actually do it, but what I recognize is that there was two things that, was, that were happening in every single situation. One, I was not protecting my mental health. I had no practices in place and even if I did, I wasn't actually doing them with intention. I was doing them as tasks and, or just wasn't doing them at all. I had stopped. And the second thing that was always happening in these moments was that I was giving myself away to the world and I was giving nothing to myself. I was giving nothing to myself. I wasn't filling up my own tank. I wasn't filling myself up with love. I wasn't filling myself up with abundance. I, was filling myself, I wasn't filling myself up. So everywhere I went, I was operating on empty. When you operate on empty, you don't know which way is left and right. And even if people try to give you to fill you up, it doesn't do it justice, not because it's not worthy of being in your space, but because again, you don't know which le what, what is left and what is right. And so in a way you put up a block, you put up a barrier and you prevent it from happening because you're not giving it to yourself. And so over the course of time, I really had to learn what self-love looked like. I really had to learn what receiving that self-love from myself looked like. It wasn't just love myself, it was receive that love that I'm giving to myself. And I had to stop giving myself away to the world because I had nothing left for myself. I was a giver. I am a giver. But I want to give fully and I want to give wholeheartedly and I want to love unconditionally and I just want to give everything that I can but I can only give so much if I have very little to give. If I have nothing in the tank, what I am running on empty. I won't be able to get very far. So I share these stories with all of you just to let you know, to remind you that mental, protecting our mental health is a daily job. Every day we have an opportunity to feel everything we wanna feel in life. We're not guaranteed tomorrow, so today we have an opportunity to be proactive in every space that we possibly can. So what I've chosen to do for the last year straight is I have set up a morning routine and a night routine to make sure that my mental health is always protected. So that way if anything does happen to come across my space, I'm ready. I've prepared. 
It doesn't mean it doesn't hurt. It doesn't mean that it's not a challenge, but it means it's less hurt and less of a challenge because I'm constantly filling up myself. So briefly, I'll share with you in the morning, I don't let anything outside of me enter my space until I've entered my own space. What I mean by that is my phone stays out of my room. That is my sacred space. I do not respond to anything, social media or people based for the first 45 minutes to an hour of my day. All I do is be with myself. I take a shower, cold shower at that. I make my bed, I make coffee, I make breakfast, I journal. I don't even read yet because that would be injecting somebody else's life into mine before I've done that for myself. So I take that time to myself. I allow myself to have thoughts. I just go through the motions in the morning and I just fill up my own cup. And then over the course of the day, I'm able to give to other people's cup. At the end of the day, I fill up my journal. I slowly wind down. I separate myself again from the world. I stop injecting everybody else's into mine. I watch a show. Let's be realistic here. And then I go to sleep and I've prepared myself for that morning. So it's a constant morning to evening, morning to evening to make sure that again, I am prepared, that I'm priming my day and that at the end, I am bringing today to a close so today does not bleed into tomorrow. So that tomorrow is its own day and today is its own day that has come to a close. So those are just some of the things that I do for my mental health. I obviously meditate as often as I can. Right now I'm on a good streak of every day. I read, I eat healthy, I work out every day, or at least as best as I can. I go for walks when it's warm enough out, uh, which I know is an excuse. I should go for walks all the time. I do a lot of things because if I don't do these things, I notice that I'm not running on an optimal level. And if I don't feel like I'm running on an optimal level, then I fear falling to the bottom. And so I wanna to continue to stay on top of it over and over and over again. And the more I can do that, the stronger I get, the more sturdy in, in my foundation I get. And so and no matter what comes my space, no matter what comes my way, I'm capable of handling it. Again, it doesn't mean it's not gonna be a challenge, doesn't mean it's not gonna be painful, but I can do it. And so can you. And so to finish with this video, I wanna remind you that you are a light in this world and that whether you choose to shine today or whether you choose to shine tomorrow, we will be here waiting for you to shine your bright ass light because we need you. We don't just want you in this world, we need you in this world. You are a valuable piece of this puzzle of humanity that we are playing. And I just want you to know that no matter how alone you feel, you will never truly be alone because you will have people like myself here in your corner every single day no matter what. You are loved, I hear you, I see you, and I'm standing beside you every step of the way in this arena of misunderstood mental health. I love you so much. You are a beautiful soul. I believe in everything that you are going to bring to this world. You got this. You, you got this. Thanks for watching, I appreciate you. If you found any value, comment below or like this video. And if you have your mental health um, protection and proactivity and care uh, strategies and practices, please drop them below. I would love to hear what you're doing and I think so would the world. So I appreciate you. We'll talk soon. Have the most incredible day.